Okay, now I want to give you a little feel for the power of this river. This wave is very big and it will stop the paddlers if they're not careful at this spot. So what they're trying to do is move through this place quickly so they can get to gate 18 and have a smooth line towards 19 and the finish. So I'll pull out of that move, try to get my boat turning and try to stay on line. And you can see I'm a little bit late for gate 19. Thanks for, thanks for being here. Oh gosh, I, I love coming to your house. I love coming to Durango, Colorado. I love coming to the Animas River. We're sitting right in front of that. There's Whitewater, what, a quarter mile downstream of here? Well, there's Solemn Gates quarter mile and there, the Whitewater starts yeah, pretty soon after that. So folks, I'm with Kent Ford. Uh, we're doing this interview on behalf of Southern Appalachian Paddle Sports Museum. Uh, and we have a series of videos on our website, which is paddlingmuseum.org, where we interview various uh, historical figures and pioneers in the sport. And Ken Ford, your life in this sport certainly qualifies you of, as a person who had great impact and, and, you know, especially in your formative years and continuing on now uh, as you and I age together and try to stay connected to the sport. But uh, your legacy in the sport I see is sort of being important on four different points, and especially as it relates to the Southern Appalachians. One is in the sport of slalom racing, which I want to hear about that here in a couple minutes, starting with your roots as a, a young person, a teenager in the D.C. area, um, and, and how you spent a good part of your career in the South racing there. Um, events management roles that you played, especially as an announcer in five different Olympic games. Five Olympics, yeah. yeah public address amazing. announcer on site in five different Olympic games and helping organize the presentation of those elect, those uh, Olympics and other world championships events and so on. Instruction, whitewater instruction, skills development, uh, and your impacts there both as an instructor but also as a media producer, you have a number of videos out that help have helped hundreds and thousands of people learn how to be better paddlers. And finally, uh, especially here in, in uh, recent years, you've taken on the role of documentarian and historian of the sport. Uh, and we'll talk about the ways you have done that. So it, it you moved away from the Southern Appalachians, gosh, almost 30 years ago now? A long time, yeah, early 90s. Early 90s, and here we yeah. are in 2021. So folks in the South aren't as familiar with you as some of us old folks are because we paddle with you and raced with you and so on. But, uh, um, but much of this legacy evolved in the Southern Appalachians, and, um, and so we want to tie that together. But let's get started by talking about your uh, experiences in paddling and how you got into recreational paddling and then slalom. Just talk about uh, where you were, who you were with, what that was like, how, why you were inspired. Yeah, well, really through all my uh, exposure to paddle sports, I've been kind of really lucky to be in the right place at the right time. And getting started in paddling was no different. You know, I grew up in Washington, D.C., and, uh, you know, and when I was like 16, 17 years old, right down the road was this summer camp with, run by Tom McEwen, you know, and the McEwens were, and still are, just huge icons. And, and, uh, Tom's brother Jamie was an Olympian in 1972. That, that's right. The family continues to own that camp, I believe, right? Yeah, yeah they own two camps now, okay. but yeah, it, 
amazing impact on the sport that they've had. And, uh, and then in Washington, D.C., a lot of things were sort of coming together at the time. The, there, were, uh, there was a big science community, and that actually was important. My dad was a scientist. So um, the science people kind of saw the river as something to be figured out, and it became the hobby. In early years, many of the people involved in the sport were, were in the sciences. You know, and, and, in, uh, in, the, in the south, Oak Ridge, Tennessee, the home of the National Laboratories, that was a hotbed of paddling. Yeah, All those I engineers bet. just loved yeah. the, the physics of moving water and the physics of putting a boat through Yeah, it's a quirky thing. And uh, so D.C., they have, uh, um, you, you know, in the early 70s, I get my driver's license. That's my ticket to freedom, so to speak. The river, Potomac River is 15 miles, 15 minutes away with great white water. Um, and coming together right then was the influence of Jamie McEwen's uh, medal at the 72 Olympics. You know, of course, that gave the whole community a big shot in the arm. The movie Deliverance came out in 1973, and that gave Whitewater this big shot in the arm. And then uh, um, through the 70s, you had this transition from fiberglass, super breakable boats to Kevlar to plastic boats that... Uh, Rotomolded plastic. Rotomolded plastic boats. And, you know, that... You know, during the 70s, people are like, eh, never going to pal that. But then it took over, of course. So, um, uh, you know, I would, uh, growing up in D.C., you got to see all those things happening. And the, the leaders of the sport there, you know, tackled some real methodical instruction and, you know, took people out on the rivers. They did a lot of environmental advocacy. You know, this guy, uh, Bob Harrigan, he would take... Stuart Udall out canoeing on the weekends. And Stuart you know? Udall was John F. Kennedy's Department of Interior. Secretary. Yeah, that's right. That's yeah. right. So, you know, and and uh, um, responsible for things later, like um, you know, Wilderness Act and and uh, national parks like the um, CNO Canal National Park, and you know, just a lot of advocacy for rivers and. And there was some organization that uh, was was. Uh, in place thanks to the Canoe Cruisers Association, Canoe Cruisers Association, which is maybe the U.S.'s most venerable uh, local regional canoe club, paddling club. Yeah, that's right. And what they did, I mean, it was really simple at the time. Uh, you know, they just sort of th had these small events that put everyone together. You know, the um, swimming pool sessions on Sunday mornings where everyone would go and learn to roll. And, and uh you know, so I'm doing that when I'm like 17, 18 years, 16, 17, 18 years old. And, and then following that, you'd go out on the CNO Canal and break the ice and hang a few slalom gates. And, and um, that was skill building. And then they did these sort of methodical classes with these old guys, younger than we are now, right? Doing uh, sort of chalkboard lessons on how the river worked and whatnot. And my learning was much more experiential. Yeah. <laughs> we call it the crash and burn method, but. Yeah, it, it was uh, an amazing um, venue to pick up the sport. And you're, right? you, you had told me that your family uh, was into paddling as a recreational weekend type pursuit, but then Slalom was much more a part of the, of the, the mainstream of whitewater recreation at the time, and somehow you latched on to slalom and maybe that had well pretty do. much in the 70s everyone who paddled would go to slalom races for, for one that's where you saw the other paddlers you know there's no internet there's no no other way to contact paddlers there are no stores so the way you contacted other people in this cool new thing was going to events and uh and also remember early 70s the boats are super fragile and yeah. so you know, if you didn't have the skills, you were breaking your boat all the time. So slalom gates were a good training mechanism to, you know, sort of protect your investment in the boat. Um, so they, so the, you know, this series of events on week spring weekends gradually grew, and yeah, for youngsters it was super appealing. And on the, in regard to youngsters, there was a a core group of maybe a dozen you know that pursued it hard and became quite innovative and successful in the sport including yourself so talk about 
those friends of yours yeah. that uh, you evolved with. And uh, so it basically started as just friends going to the you know, sixteen year olds want to go and find some trouble. Well, instead of trouble in the woods, we found trouble on the river, and the you know we were. Um, luckily by then already influenced by this kind of, you know, gold, um, bronze medal Olympian. So we sort of got nudged into this competitive track and the f folks that were growing up at about that time included John Lugbill and Davey Hearn and Kathy Hearn and Bob Robison, Ron Lugbill, um, Chris McCormick, you know, one time or another, I think all of us had well, they won most of the medals. You know, they were, you know, Kathy, I think, 11 medals at World Championships. And, and you've got how many medals at World Championships? Well, I have two from team event. Right. Yep. And two gold medals. Two gold medals. Yeah. With uh, Lugbill and Hearn and John Lugbill, five uh, World Championship titles, Davey won, and four second places. You Kathy know. has a gold. Kathy has a bunch of gold. She Ooh, has okay. in her 11. But in there. an individual, she... Yeah. Yeah. But we all just grew up together. I mean, we're, we're, there, there was another kind of interesting thing that happened right then. Right after the 72 Olympics, they changed the rules to make it a more aggressive sport. And a more aggressive as in faster, more risk-taking. There used to be penalties, like huge penalties, 20-second penalty for hitting a gate in a certain way. And that was dropped to 10 seconds, then 5 seconds, then now 2 seconds. But... Uh, um, the lowering of the penalty for hitting a pole meant that you went faster, took more risks. And, um, and so that was sort of this door that just opened right as we were going to be 17, 18 and years another old. Another rule change was allowing or providing that the, the bow of the canoe could be lower than the cockpit. We used that's to, right. Earlier, before then, it was the, the bow of the C1 or the C2 had to be higher in elevation than the cockpit. So now you can squeeze the, the bow and stern down low, which enabled you to... go. You could go under the slalom gates. So right. it, it was an entirely different technique of going under the gates than doing anything possible to avoid that 20-second penalty of yeah. hitting it from the wrong direction. So, um, so it's kind of like it was this fresh slate really primed for a bunch of 17 year olds. You know, we're actually a couple years apart in ages, but you know, just roughly speaking, that gives you a feel for the atmosphere. And uh, that combined with great whitewater in Washington. But then there was one other, well, two other big components. One was there's this indoor testing tank that the US Navy uses. It's called the uh, David Taylor Model Basin. And the model basin is a half mile long canal indoors, 70 degrees water and air. We started paddling year round in that thing. And so um, we were able to make a jump on the rest of the world because we paddled year round. You know, and you say, when you say the rest of the world, you mean literally. There were no venues even in Europe that were indoors. It, the, the Czechoslovaks or the French were out doing cross country skiing as they're training for kayaking. You know, and we were indoors paddling racing against each other half for fun and uh and half for uh you know bragging rights and then uh enter um a couple of coaches one jack brocious who's a flat wire sprint coach and then uh and uh then a little later bill endicott but brocious was an interesting story he's a flat wire sprint coach but he'd let us jump in on the workouts so he'd send these flat water kayaks zoom down 500 meters and they get to the end and it takes them like 10 minutes to turn around and, get, <laughs> yeah, right. and uh, you know, and we're like uh, huffing and puffing to get to the end. But as soon as we got to the other end, they'd go, finally, you're here. And they'd send off their, you know, they'd do their next lap and we'd spin around. <laughs> so, so it ended up being really good training that Brocious set us up with for a, a year or two there. But then Bill Endicott uh, came in the picture and he's a... Uh, super bright guy, Harvard, etc. And he had um, raced a little. He'd, he'd before raced, that. He'd, jet, he'd narrowly missed the Olympic team in '72, uh, but and, and so maybe he had a little bit of a grudge from missing the Olympic team, and also he had 
just a lot of passion for the sport. And Bill didn't, he didn't have any kids that were into the sport. This was his passion for the sport. He was a congressional staffer, as I recall. Yeah, that's right. He ran, the, he ran the Democratic Study Group. So he was writing the think tank um, papers for the De Democratic Party all through a lot of the you so know, it was 70s his, and this 80s. This was his volunteer outlet, you know, distraction from the real world. Yeah. Uh, and he became notable as one of the great coaches in the world. Yeah, and it was it was awesome because he gave, he, to his credit, he figured out a way to take these kind of um, not necessarily even competitive gang, a random group of 17-year-olds and steer them into a more con competitive avenue. And uh, so by 77, 79, and beyond, 77 and 79, we were you know, clearly on the scene worldwide. You know, I was, I, I was uh, national champion in 77 and uh, maybe sixth or something at the Worlds. And, and we were like fifth, sixth, and eighth at the World Championships. As teenagers. As teenagers. And, and uh, then by, um, and curiously, Lugbill and Hearn had not made the team that year because, uh, well, they just hadn't made the team that they, year. They so they, they, were, they, they, were, were, they were younger. So by 79, they had a grudge, and they were first and second at the world for the next decade. Well, so, and it, there's another component to this, and maybe it ties back to the science and sort of engineering context of where you were, but you guys all got into boat design with that change in the rules and the, the ability to make lower volume bows and stirs to get under gates. You guys were cranking out two or three new designs a year, you know, for a given, like yeah, a C1. Yeah, Davey mainly, but yes, uh, um, John and Bob were involved in that. I was involved with the Slipper C1. Right. Um, and yeah, there was there was a boat design component to and it. And it was a competitive advantage for several years because... That's right. Because well, the U.S. was two steps ahead of Europe in boat design in those days. And uh, thanks to Johnny Evans of California, the C, the close cockpit C2 was born, moving the cockpits from the ends of the boat to the middle. Right. So and the and boat offset, a, offset, offset a, little a little bit so that your right-hand paddler was closer to his side, but the weight balance. Yeah, and that uh, that made, that sort of blew open the door for C2 paddling. And, and so all of a sudden, Washington, D.C. is like the hub of the sport for C2. And Mike and Steve Jarvis were world champions at one point or medalists at least medalists right and they they were the first c2 team to really uh execute well in the closed cockpit close cockpit cockpit configuration at least in the u.s uh, i would maybe maybe I, I don't know. yeah I, maybe uh, Lugel and hearn did well yeah uh, uh, davy hearn and uh ron Lugbill race c2 and john Lugbill and bob robinson race c2 there it was it was another very competitive uh, thing, kind of like bragging rights. Not, not, we weren't bragging anyone. It was just like that. Who won the workout that day? You know, it was, uh, it was cool. But anyway, that that really set us up well all the way through the '80s to be sort of on the cutting edge of the sport. So r river runners, uh, recreational river runners, by the late '70s and 1980 were getting a little distance from slalom because we had plastic boats and there were just a lot more people interested in paddling. But slalom technique was still the foundation of river running technique, I would say. And what- Yeah, what that's are, right. So you watch like by 1979, uh, the world championships were up in uh, Jonquière, Quebec, but the races that were in the Southeast, uh, all the paddlers came to them. That, you know, still by late 70s, everyone had, at least would go watch a race I was now and then. at those races. <laughs> yeah, but, but then, like you're saying, things, things turned a corner. The boats were more bomb-proof, and the, the techniques stayed with recreational paddlers, but the racing became less important. Ken, in the Southern Appalachians, there were a, a number of important slalom races, many of which were on the Nantahala River. Uh, but by 1980, they were on the Ocoee River, and there was the Locust Fork in Alabama and the Teleco in Tennessee. But Nanahill Outdoor Center, when it was founded in the early 70s, 1972, uh, Pace and Kennedy and leadership there made a point to hire 
uh, slalom racers that had achieved a lot, Olympians specifically, to come to NOC and help build NOC, not just as a rafting company, but importantly as a skill center. And th that sort of embedded uh, slalom skills in the core of river of paddling instruction, I think. And you came to NOC, you were recruited to come to NOC, just like Payson had recruited Angus Morrison and John Burton and Carrie Ashton. Louise Holcomb. Louise Holcomb and others at the founding. You came along in which year? Uh, 70, 79. 79. And uh, so Burton recruited me to come to NOC. And I think there were a number of other competitors there. And so it was kind of what we did. You know, the world championships would be in June. As soon as, you know, you'd get on the plane the day after the world championships in Germany somewhere or, you know, Europe typically. Um, fly back and three days later you were guiding a raft on the Chatuga or, or teaching or, a kayak or clinic. Or teaching a kayak clinic, yeah. So, um, the, and that became a really dynamic scene through the 80s because you had the this, NOC instruction scene. Yeah, you, you had these, you had like these very high end uh, competitors, some of them with a very technical knowledge. Uh, Angus Morrison, very technical in his. Uh, an analysis of stroke dynamics and so on. And, and Angus and um, Chris Spilius, a flat wire sprint racer at the time, but the, those guys, you know, infused all the instruction community with a very technical mindset that got whittled down into delivery for, for the recreational public. And so there, you know, there were all these first Olympian, then world championship level racers, then you know, then just top 10 in the U.S. sort of racers that all gravitated to uh, teaching there at NOC. And then... And, and just to stop there a second, NOC was an appealing place because it had year-round dam release flows. There were always gates hanging right there at the NOC campus. Yeah, that's right. So a racer could train and work. And some racers, like Scott Shipley a few years later, actually worked at the daycare center, uh -huh. you know, uh, while he lived there and trained. Or, typ or typically you do, do your work guiding rafts or teaching a kayak class, and then after work you'd go and paddle gates to yeah. part of your training. And even that was like just building the skill set really high. But, you know, I think the racers alone wouldn't have done it for NOC and for the Southeast. I think the thing that really made the difference was it was a collection of really remarkable people. And, uh, you know, led by Payson, who really wanted to build a utopia society in many ways. And, uh, and he, he attracted other really high quality people who weren't necessarily racers, but they just became uh, embedded in the scene, picked up the, the technical aspects by osmosis, many of them, and then de developed incredible teaching skills just due to their fine humanity. Right. You know, and that's what, what really bumped things along. And the names and of some of those people in the 80s that were central to NOC's instruction program. Well, folks like Ken Kastorf, no, com no real competitive background, but you know, huge impact on teaching the sport, or Arlo Kleinrath, or, I mean... Uh, Mary Doremer. Mary Doremer, um, um, KB. Uh, Tom DeQueer. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, I, I don't even like doing a list, because it was, everyone there was just infused with this. It was, the dinnertime discussions, you know, ranged from you know, the, the optimum paddle stroke from this Olympian Angus Morrison to the optimum delivery mechanism of teaching technique through um, a non-competitor, uh, Eric Neese, who just had a brilliant mindset for how to, how to package this stuff. And uh, then there was one other thing that I think was critical to that, and that was the NOC at the time, talking in the early 80s, late 70s, was the only paddle school from Pennsylvania to Florida, essentially. And so anyone who wanted to learn to paddle from Pennsylvania to Florida went to NOC. And as a result, NOC all through the 80s, really, had full 
clinics, two instructors in a van with students. And um, typically 10 students, 10 instructors, 10 students, two instructors. A trailer load of state of the art kayaks, modern uh, kayaks in the back. And five to seven vans going out every single day. You know, so typically four day and three day programs. What you got from that was two instructors working together that that Olympian would learn how to teach from someone who had just an amazing manner, you know, like a Kathy Bolin or a Mary Dreamer or a Carol May and um, or a Tom DeQueer. And, the you know, the Olympians would learn how to teach and the the not as competitive folks would learn, you know, high level technical ends of the sport. And, you know, the, the way that networked out into the paddling community, it seems to me, is you had all these customers, the, the guests, the clinic participants would learn. And many of them were leaders in their home club, the, the Carolina Canoe Club or the Atlanta Whitewater Club, and they would carry these skills back home. But another thing that I noticed about NOC in those days, it had the best retail store in the world for paddling mm -hmm. gear. And so even if you weren't a clinic customer, you would show up at NOC a few times a year to buy just a spray skirt or maybe a paddle or a boat. And and so you were at Nanahala and you would watch and there were the gates out back and there were people play boating in the falls. And a lot of these people were NOC staff instructors and all. So it, it really permeated outward in a, a general way beyond just the tight network of the clinic instruction. That's right. And, and, and then it went beyond that in the 90s particularly you started to get the spin-offs. You started to get people would, you know, like Les Bechtel would leave NOC and go start a company in Idaho. Well, and Ken Castor, for you men, who you mentioned, started an instruction company, Endless River Adventures, right there on the Nana Highway. Right, or, uh, or Slim Ray spins off and starts a uh, river rescue dynasty out of writing books and whatnot. So, and there were many, many more. I mean, that, the spin-offs just kept, kept going yeah. at that point. Kent, in the NOC instruction realm, you became more committed to that. You continued some racing in the meantime, but you became the head of the instruction department at NOC. You had a passion for instructing. Yeah, that's right. And you know, a lot of the, the framework for that was from Bunny Johns. You know, again, she was had this scientific mindset. You know, she's a biologist, but she brought that to instruction at NOC, you, you know, by by having things as simple as the evaluation program after each course. You know, it, it was important to us to get critique from our uh, clinic guests. And, and that helped inspire you to know how to steer your courses the next time. And, and uh, she designed the ACA uh, instruction program, the American Canoe Association instruction program that really now is the broadest uh, instruction program worldwide and the you can still see bunny's fingerprints on that you know how that all transpired and by the way bunny immediately preceded you as the instruction head in noc right right and she was she herself was a international world championship level competitor in uh wild water more so than Salem, i think but she did a lot of open canoe racing you know, nationally around the U.S. as well. So yeah, she, she had that slalom back, or the, the competitive background as well that kind of built her skills to bring forward into exactly. instruction. Exactly, plus just an amazing personality to, oh, to yeah. deliver that, you know. And I, I think she inspired a lot of people to realize that, wow, okay, it's, it's um, how well you teach is the most important thing here. And, and Bunny, by the way, Bunny's uh, interview with Bunny Johns is on the, paddlingmuseum.org website nice. along with other people we've mentioned Payson Kennedy and others Les Bechtel we mentioned so uh, there, there's a common thread there's a thread through. there so to the video thing um, you know you mentioned just a moment ago how NOC was sort of spinning this off to paddling clubs in the area and that sort of thing people people who came to a clinic would then go home to their local club and they'd start teaching the way they'd been taught at NOC and and uh the same thing sort of stepped off into video because early on the Red Cross had funded these projects that Russ Nichols produced, fabulous films, uh, 
uncalculated risk, margin for error, and white wire primer. All of those were filmed at NOC using NOC sort of staff, and and uh, so there was a big heritage there. But then, uh, early '80s, the instruction program um, tackled doing some uh, instructional films, and you know those went well. Those were really good, and I didn't really have much part in those at all. But um, you know, folks like Mark Sandell. Uh, and Castorf had a, and Dave Moshe had big roles and was Grace Under Pressure one of those pieces? No, that was sort of a spin off okay. as well. Um, so Grace Under Pressure spun off at about the same time I stepped off. Which is a how to roll video. Yeah, how to how roll to, in Whitewater. Combat that's right. rolling. That's right. And uh, so at about that time I was sort of nearing the end of my um, helm as head of instruction at NOC. And I, I was sort of really overwhelmed with doing lots of special projects, race announcing, coaching, and video production. I was starting to just on a weekend here and there do a couple small video productions, the C1 Challenge, the Citizen Racers Workshop, these tiny, tiny audience uh, projects. But, you know, I, it got to the point that as head of instruction, I had too many personal projects going to do the right thing for the NOC instruction program. So I left that job very happily in great hands with uh, Gordo, but... Gordon Grant. Yeah, uh, yeah. Another former world championship level competitor. And I, uh, um, but I, so my career sort of took a turn then into doing spe this amazing collage of special projects, all roughly tied to paddle sports. But with a, with a focus on instruction, skills, Instruction yeah. most well on the in the video production front, and you and about that time you moved here to Durango. Yeah, that's right. But I'd also do these race announcing right. uh, events. But you know that to me that was um, very similar in that it was an educational project. You know, I was trying to educate the spectators on what this crazy kayak sport was all about. You know, in many cases the people show up at events and they at a kayak race and they go well where's the ball that was always the joke you yeah. know where's the ball <laughs> you know like where's the hoop <laughs> how do right. they score here you know and so um you know race announcing at, at kayak races was an educational project of, a, of its own type and your first significant announcing experience was the 1989 world championships on the savage river in maryland yep and I'd, you and lamar sims teamed up to do that yeah i'd missed i'd missed the u.s team and so, like as my uh, um, second choice, I got to be the race announcer. And, uh, <laughs> the booby prize. The booby prize, <laughs> yep. And it, it was great. I mean, it sort of started me on this whole bizarre tangential career of sorts. You know, career being a month a year for the next 10 years. Well, so. and, and Lamar Sims, Dartmouth uh, racing. Uh, actually, Hampshire College. Hampshire College, with a, I'm sorry. Um, under Jay Evans, right. the Olympic coach, and uh, um, yeah, he's also a Harvard and a Harvard, uh, Law assi School. Harvard Law assistant DA in Denver, that sort of thing. He had a, he had a lot of firepower up here, you know. So, and notably, it, an African American of you know, and there are very few African Americans in, in, especially in those days, that were in the sport, and even still today, right? Relatively right. few. But so Lamar became your long-time enduring announcing partner. That's right. And you guys the silver are tongue. awesome in the booth because I've been to venues and listened to you guys. And you've, in fact, been the uh, English-speaking public address announcer with Lamar in five different Olympics. That's right. And a bunch of World Cups, World Championships, and whatnot in between. Right. And that that was just dynamite fun. I mean, it, and again, it was kind of a tangent of educating the public about paddle sports um, that, uh, you know, I mean, we, we had a sort of methodical way about going about it. We, we, went, we knew that people would flow in and out of the events and we'd introduce them to what was going on at different times during the day and try to introduce them to the personalities of the competitors and that sort of thing. Many of whom were your friends. I mean, you, you knew the uh, competitors personally in many cases. Yeah, that's the that's the benefit of being the, getting the booby prize of not making the team. You're, <laughs> you're trained the whole year with those. Well, things. and it wasn't it wasn't as simple as st stepping into the announcing booth and starting. You you your title was actually uh, event uh, 
Uh, pre- presentation manager. Presentation manager. Yeah. I'm sorry. So, so a lot of the Olympic events are structured that way with a sport side and a and a venue side, and the presentation manager sort of spans the two, coordinating the how the sport is presented to the spectators. Bottom line, which actually it in turn influences TV production a little bit because t- t- TV folks are a little less familiar, and so there there's a little bit of that's right. The, there you, as you know well. that. Um, there are things you wouldn't think of, like, uh, and you can tell when it goes wrong when the when there's a person on a microphone at a football game, and they're trying to give their two minute introduction to the event that's about to happen, and then all of a sudden the uh, PA ad- announcer says, "Whoever has the red car, your lights are on," you know, or whatever. And of course, that's the nightmare for NBC. So. Uh, those things do need to work in concert yeah, yeah. through a rundown, and there's a quiet time that's dedicated to the broadcast so that they can they can be sure that there are no stupid announcements <laughs> about pick up your trash right when they're uh, right. they're introducing the Super Bowl, you know, whatever. But yeah, that, uh, that that is great fun to be involved in, and of course, working five Olympics, each of those five had a dramatically different flavor, you know, from Barcelona to. Uh, Atlanta, which had a very, you know, sort of Western structure to it, to, um, to Sydney, the similar, but then Beijing is like totally randomly different, you know. Well, what a, what a great uh, skills challenge for you to learn up about how this stuff is supposed to happen and, and get really good at it. They wouldn't have invited you back yeah. for for the next Olympics if had you not done really well. And again, I, I was there for the uh, 1996 Olympics held on the Okoe you know, in the Southern Appalachians when you announced, and it was so great to see the circle. Yeah, and to, the, to this day, that's the biggest crowd that's ever seen a Whitewater event in the U.S. I mean, that yeah. was, those were huge crowds. Um, it sold out, and the, the, the Southeast and, and uh, Ducktown and the Ocoee just went all out to, you know, put the red carpet out for the community to come and see Whitewater well, and just, paddling. And let's back up a little bit. You were in the flow of the effort to land the games, uh, the, the slalom events, no. bring the, you know, bring those to Okoe and into the, into the. Uh, no, I really, I, I was a bystander to okay. that. I, I didn't have any role in making that happen for sure. I was a, a in, very interested bystander, but um, my role to the 96 Olympics really was as presentation manager and you know, doing a couple months of front work to to put the event on for the pu- for the public there. Well, interestingly, you know, we talked about the way slalom racing was intertwined with recreational paddling, especially in, through the '70s. But by 1996, slalom, you know, f- for a 25-year-old recreational paddler, slalom was not in their it's like in, in learning present. Greek is a different, yeah, a different there, sport. There had been a split, and part yeah. of that is that uh, with the 92 Olympics in Barcelona, for the first time, slalom had been welcomed into Olympics, the Olympics, I guess technically as a demonstration sport still at the time, and but it became more or less permanent after, and, and remains p- part of the, uh, part of the uh, games now every four years or five years in this case yeah. up in Tokyo but if they happen uh, yeah well I saw in the paper this morning they're gonna have it so okay fingers crossed um, but um, uh, but it, the, the the effort by the Atlanta at the Atlanta organizing committee that had won the the Olympics in Atlanta there was an effort led by Don Giddens and and I'm not sure who else out of Atlanta to uh, to have Solomon included, Mike Larimer, Mike Larimer, yeah. Steve Thomas. It was it was a little bit of a David Jones, right? Yeah, David Jones. Um, uh, and it, well, it's, it's interesting because the um, there was a thought in the Whitewater community at the time that if we mentioned building a river, that was a non-starter. You know, the only way we could get Whitewater in the Olympics, we thought, was by use by having an existing river to host the venue. And so it was quite extraordinary that Billy Payne and the, you know, the head of the Olympics in Atlanta was willing to send one event way outside, outside you know, the state lines for, of Georgia, outside the state lines of Georgia to Tennessee, and 
the um as a result the the politics of that whole thing happening was extraordinarily complicated and um it's only labor of love by a lot of people that made it pull off and i i my labor of love was coming in on the last two months to help present it but um my hats off to the people who really so the brought d- just it for to context what is now called the upper Ocoee, which gets uh, scheduled water releases in it, um, you know, a couple dozen days a year or so nowadays. Yeah, at the time, it never had releases. It never had release. It was a dry riverbed with a bypass hydroelectric project, Ocoee number three. And now there are scheduled releases there. And the rapids through that Olympic course are more challenging than the traditional section of the Ocoee, which is called the middle Ocoee. And, you know, back before the Olympic course, there were slalom races every year down on the middle of Coe, really at the put-in rapids. Yep. And, uh, you know, rafting companies accommodated, but they're ultimately, outfitting became busy enough that it was increasingly difficult to have slalom. So slalom kind of faded from uh, middle of Coe stuff. But, the, you know, the that upper, upper uh Okoe Olympic course is a result of that effort. And, yep. it's and that is an extraordinary event, just amazing. And, uh, you know, it, but it is a shame that it doesn't see races to this day, you know, and it, it, it sees smaller events. And it, I think uh, th- there's just a lot of competing uh, influences and competing um, uh, interests involved in the Okoe. Well, in, in, from the standpoint of where where can slalom best be executed, we've got the U.S. National Whitewater Center at Charlotte. There's there's the venue at Oklahoma City, uh, and and the norm around the world these days, ninety uh, percent of the big international races are on pump pumped artificial courses yeah. because you can you can perfect and idealize you know the the dynamics of the flow and you can change the structures in the river and the eddies can be deep and to accommodate deep pivot turns you know for yeah. upstream gates and so on yeah it's uh i mean that's it's been great for presenting the sport to the world it's there is something lost by not being in nature you oh, know and the and um you know particularly old timers and i sort of spanned both eras but the old timers particularly miss the you know the heart and soul that you get on a on a natural river and the um the feel that you get from from those events so do you think but, do you think the Okoe olympic course would be suitable current day for a world championships in terms of the oh yeah oh yeah they'd start the they'd start at gate nine or so of the olympics would be much shorter yeah but yeah yeah it's it's harder white water than a lot of these man-made courses the the the, the uh, time for one racer to get through the course in the 96 Olympics was maybe two and a half minutes. Yeah, uh, now it now it's, you know, it's 90, 90 seconds for 90 seconds. For, yeah, for a top kayak. Which is a little bit of a made for TV sort of. Yeah, that's uh, right. I mean, the evolution of the sport. It is awkward for television to have longer events. It, you know, that that's that's awkward. Well, you can't you talked about your um, your your video production as a way to expand and extend your role as instructor um, and about the time that you left NOC as instruction head you moved here to the Animus River in Durango Colorado and uh, Durango was not the hot whitewater town it is now and by the way uh, Durango probably on a per capita basis has more whitewater enthusiasts in it than even Asheville, North Carolina, which is my where I live. Yeah. It's <laughs> pretty astounding. I mean, the number of rafts and private rafts, kayaks, canoes, stand-up paddle boards in this town is off the charts. I mean, I, I, there's of course, there's no way to measure that. If someone did a door-to-door, well, we look around here, there's uh, um, six kayaks in that garage, uh, two canoes in that one. Uh, you know, it's just... Well, and we've got, you know, the 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 uh, town of Durango has the Animus River with Class Three whitewater in the center of downtown. Yep. And upstream here is Class World Class Class Four and Five paddling. Yeah, that's right. And um, and you just 
as an aside, you have been active civically here in Durango a bit as an environmental advocate, but as an advocate for the sport. And uh, there's a whitewater park that's been developed uh, with two, two different major phases of design and construction in the riverbed to create features. Um, and you've been really interested in that. And of course, you're, you, when I called you yesterday, you said I was out, I was out paddling earlier this morning. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so you get out there. But I'd, the be, I'd be careful to say I, I don't have, uh, I have my fingers in a few of those pies, but I'm not a leader by any means. Oh, you, those, well, those uh, you're, you're modest. But, uh, people, I no, think, no, no, no. I think if I interviewed other people in town, they would no, talk about no, the no. influence you have. No, no, no. Uh, but having moved here, well, you, the, you I, were, remained energized about instruction and this video production effort that you were was yeah, nascent so at the time. Grew. Before I left NOC, I'd met this um, who be, this guy who became my business partner, John Davis. He lived in Kentucky. He was the founder of the National Paddling Film Festival, which is in Lexington, Kentucky. And he uh, he said, you know, sort of the equivalent of a cold call in the restaurant at NOC. He goes hey, we are doing instructional videos someday. And I was like, uh, okay. You know, and, and we just started doing these like little weekend projects of paddling instruction videos. And, and that took off. I mean, we were amazed how, how much, uh, uh, how well res uh, received they were and how many they sold. And that's part of what made me go, wow, okay, I almost have a full-time business here of doing nothing but these, and which we morphed into doing kayak, uh, river kayak uh, films like the Kayaker's Edge or uh, canoe instruction, solo, solo canoe instruction films, um, uh, whitewater safety films, that sort of thing. And, and, the, uh, and the, there, there was one video you did about Eskimo roll. Yeah, the okay. kayak roll. And that was, the kayak roll one was really the best seller. That sold really well. And I found that these things sold uh, they'd sell well in boating communities, but they'd really sell to people who lived in a place that didn't have a paddling school. You know, just worldwide, they, you yeah. know, someone who was just thirsty to know about kayaking and didn't know where to turn. Maybe they lived in St. Louis and yeah. were driving to the Ocoee on weekends and were just or Los Genos, Chile, or wherever. You yeah. know, they, um, in we had a couple titles translated to Fran French. You know, because the French, despite being amazing paddlers, they didn't really have a, a methodology for teaching recreational paddling at the time. So, so in the in the uh, 80, we talked about in the 70s and into the 80s, uh, the, the pro proliferation of skills through instruction was really more of an in-person thing. The, the person that might come to a clinic or might at NOC or might go to a workshop put on by a paddling club it was a little more word of mouth, physical presence, but with the uh, with the rise of VHS and DVD video, all of a sudden there was this opportunity to push it out further. That's right. That's and right. So, and, uh, and so I really was just I was the communicator for some amazing instructors and and uh, sort of conveying what this uh, what had been learned collectively in the southeast by amazing instructors and. And paddlers and and uh, I, I managed to sort of build a business conveying that to the broader public. So it was a it was a, a media production um, uh, enterprise that you you were challenged to develop, and so in yeah. And we'd do a new title every year. Um, typically in the fall, I'd sort of think of you know it's sort of the gestation period of okay, what's going to be the next title? Uh, and during the winter, I'd be writing uh, outlines and storyboarding it. In the spring, we would do the do a big shoot. You know, usually ten or sometimes twenty days of shooting. Um, then the rest of the year, a big editing project to bring it all together and start marketing it and yeah. figure out the next title. So, and you know, in those was, days, uh, because it was there was no uh, YouTube and Vimeo, it, it was mailed VHS tapes or DVD tapes. And you were charging twenty nine ninety five, pretty much for all those productions. Right? Yeah, that's right. And before that time, people would would learn how to roll from the two page fold out of a book. That's how you I know they're. It. Yeah, I'm like you it. know that you can probably visualize those pictures right there. Oh God, is in a in a book, and uh, you know clearly a book's not as ideal for teaching someone how to roll as video is. So, yeah, video was a a, gr a great um, way for 
for, for the public at large to learn various aspects. So that enterprise, which still exists, but really doesn't have any revenues anymore. Yeah, I've it's, set it's, it all free. It's all for free. Performancevideo.com. Yep, that's and right. And that, that website is alive and maintained. And all the all those video productions that we've talked about and more reside on there. And you can still order a DVD, I suppose, but it's but there are links right there to, to video. Download and, and streaming for all those. Yeah, yeah, you can live stream and there's no fee. So uh, my guess is that if, if you want to learn how to roll a kayak or to be safe on the river or to have skills surfing a wave, performancevideo.com is still a great place to go. Uh, you know, there's plenty out there. You can go to YouTube, and, you know, Eskimo Roll, and you'll find 20. Yeah, yeah we, had pretty, we had high production values. My business partner was the senior cameraman at public television stations, first in Lexington, Kentucky, then in... Sacramento was state capital for California. So he had he had really high end camera skills and editing skills. So um, you know our our production values were sort of you know we we grew them into being sort of PBS quality. Well, and you production you recruited skills. you recruited the best instructors available like Phil Doremer and Mary Doremer and Wayne Dickert, Wayne Dickert the, and others yeah. that were your that actually did the instructing in many cases on these videos and so uh, not only are they valuable, but they're they're becoming classics now. <laughs> and, but they're still super, uh, yeah. super important and available. And uh, I know you'll continue to maintain that. Um, so Kent, uh, there are these various threads, and they all seem to to me to tie back together to something that you have been committed to in more recent years, and that is historian documentarian. Um, you've been a witness as you described, to many of the great things that have evolved in the sport, uh, you know, you may know more people in Whitewater worldwide than any single person. I, I'm, I'd be challenged to figure out who else might know, you know, have personal relationships with more people in the world that know Whitewater. But um, talk about some of your efforts to capture an archive and communicate the history of the sport and the evolution of the sport. Well, yeah, it's pretty much like you described, just through, you know, being involved in the sport since the early 70s, late 60s even, you know, I'd seen a lot of little slivers of what transpired. And through various events, I'd seen a lot of different film productions that existed. and. I, I started to have this idea that, you know, the way to tell this story about whitewater paddling would be to take the coolest video footage of each of these eras and weave it into the story of how paddling grew. And that, that became our uh, project called The Call of the River. And uh, that's available for free. Uh, well, the shorter version of it's available for free on our website there. and. Uh, and it really, you know, it starts from the um, the British uh, recreational full boat paddlers going up to study the harpoon throwing of the uh, Greenland kayakers. You know, how to throw a harpoon uh, and capture a seal and all that sort of thing. And and uh, the paddling kayaking grew throughout Europe, canoeing in France, because it had come from Quebec to France, kind of the other direction. But then um, in uh, the 1950s, the town of Salida, Colorado, they're, they're these uh, chamber of commerce folks wanted to promote the town. They have this whitewater river. So they start paying the world champions in uh, Germany and France and so on to come compete on the Arkansas River in Salida. And that, in a short telling, is how kayaking arrived in the U.S. to that one event. And a lot a lot, a handful of those people stayed in the U.S. You know, um, Roger, Roger, Paris. Roger, Roger Paris. 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 Um, uh, yeah, Walter Kirschbaum and, you know, five or six others stayed in the, in the States. Meanwhile, you had a number of folks um, uh, abandoning um, Soviet-controlled uh, Czechoslovakia um, coming to the U.S. penniless, people like Vladimir Vanha, who starred Noah Kayaks, um, Joe Sedovic, uh, 
Herka. Um, so, so a lot of the kayaking influence, 60s, 70s, 60s, 70s, came from Europe. And then, um, and then uh, you know, the boats just gradually got better. You got the influence of the Olympics in 72 and the, and the movie Deliverance. And, and it just it spread yeah, very nicely. Rotomolded molded plastic. And the skills that we've talked about evolved. And... Yeah, it, 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 it's a great story. It's, it's pretty neat to look so back. So that, that, again, that video is, the title is Call of the River. The Call of the River. The, the yep. Call of the River. And it's available on performancevideo.com. And it is worth watching anyone at any stage of the sport i'm you know i'm I'm nostalgic about this sport obviously and uh my wife kat and i sat down and watched it when it was released and uh just loved every second of it so and i I know that for you huge labor of love because you put hundreds of hours into tracking down old film that you had to convert to video and images and stories and interview uh people to interview yeah we had 50 we did 50 interviews 50 uh sources of video and film footage and 50 sources of still imagery so yeah. it was a it was a big compilation well and, that's, and it, so folks what we're talking about is something a little different from the quickie weekend youtube you know production yeah. of yeah you know I, it's sort of like whitewater kayaking meets the history channel oh you there know, we it's, go. A, it's a little bit of that flavor and it's super high quality and so um, so that's, you know, the broad reaches of the, of the of paddling sport, whitewater sport. But it seems that more recently you've put some effort into archiving slalom-related uh, images and race results and things like that. And you must have a, a library on your, on your hard drives and in your basement of all kinds of stuff. I have a pretty good archive. Not so much with slalom, but, um, you know, another thing I'm sort of studying now is how how we're going to preserve some of this history into the future for paddling. And, um, you know, I've sort of done an informal study of the museums across the country and even worldwide. Paddling uh, museums. Paddling museums, yeah. And, and there are a lot of them if you include things like the two John Wesley Powell museums or, the, um, or a jet boat museum on the Rogue River or uh, um, these private collections. There are a couple of guys who've got collections in their house of 200 kayaks of over the years you know and and uh, I, I just think it's kind of fun to fun to dip my toes in how that's going to get pre- preserved for the future not so much the boats but the whole vibe of how the how the sport the evolved. stories the images the, uh, the, the the whole thing and you know that your personal passion about that is very much in line with the purpose of Southern App- Appalachian Paddle Sports Museum. I mean, that's exactly what the group of people that are leading that in, in my part of the country are trying to assemble as it relates to the sport in the Southern Appalachians. And again, just to kind of look back on everything we've talked about, Kent, you did spend a number of years living, re- resident in our region, um, the relationship particularly with NOC and slalom racing in that part of the country and the Olympics in 96. And so your, your legacy um, will live on for decades beyond when you and I are still around. And I, I know that people will appreciate that. I'm glad to take this moment to gather those reflections from you to help round all that out. Well, it's been super fun. And, I, you know, I think as I go through this conversation with you, I realized that the thread through it for me was right place in the right time, whether it's like getting on the coattails of John Lugbill and Davey Hearn or, or, you know, missing the team and getting this crazy opportunity to do race announcing at the Olympics because no one else knew where to begin with that, you know, and, and, uh, and then the teaching thing at NOC was really, really uh, um, fun to see the quality of people that were not just competitors, but amazing instructors that that uh, that taught there and taught me a lot. So, well, you and I were lucky to to find ourselves where we were. But I, I want our viewers to know this guy 
there's no shortage of energy and smarts and creativity that this guy continues to put in uh, to this sport that we all love. So Ken, I want to thank you for carving out this time to do this. And uh, I loved hearing it and reliving it with you uh, here today. And uh, I can't wait to uh, get this thing edited and up for folks to see. You'll have to cut a lot. <laughs> no, I won't. We're going to do it all. Hey, thanks, Mark. Thank That's you. awesome. All right.